Well, hello, bonjour, and you're all very welcome this morning to our webinar, Investing to Connect Ireland and Europe, the Celtic Interconnector. This is a joint event with the European Parliament Liaison Office in Ireland and the European Movement Ireland. And we'd like to especially welcome all of you tuning in both in Ireland and in France, including members of the European Parliament and the Houses of the Rochthus on their first day back, and also ambassadors, councillors, many organisations and members of the public. We're delighted that so many of you are attending. We have a full house. Bienvenue à toutes et à tous à ce webinar sur le projet d'interconnexion mené par la France et l'Irlande, le Celtic Interconnector. Nous sommes ravis que vous soyez si nombreux à nous joindre. My name is Flor McCarthy and I've been a journalist and news reporter with various organisations over the years, mostly with Ireland's national broadcaster RTE and these days with Rochthus TV for those of you who haven't found us yet, that's the Irish Parliament's television channel. We regularly report from the European Parliament in Strasbourg. So a little bit about our hosts today. The EPLO, the European Parliament Liaison Office in Ireland, provides information on the European Parliament's role and powers on Irish MEPs and their activities, and on issues currently being considered by Parliament, which are of significance for Ireland and for Europe as a whole. EM Ireland, the European Movement Ireland, is the longest established NGO working on the European affairs, that since 1954, an independent, not-for-profit membership organisation, EM Ireland works to develop the connection between Ireland and the European Union and facilitates links between all sectors of Irish society and the EU with campaigns, information briefings and events such as this. So our running order will look like this. We have four very distinguished speakers who will each provide short opening remarks. That will be followed by a panel discussion and a Q&A with you, our audience. So we hope to have the webinar wrapped up by about 12.15. So please feel free to send in your questions on the Q&A button on Zoom. If you're joining us on Facebook and Twitter, please post your questions using the hashtag ConnectEU. Um, our colleagues are ready and waiting for your questions and I very much look forward to putting them to our panel. And just a reminder that this event is being recorded. So I'm going to introduce our speakers in a few moments, but first let's take a very brief look at the Celtic Connector itself. Interconnection lies at the very core of the objectives of the EU single market in energy and climate. It means affordable, secure and sustainable energy for all citizens and the long-term decarbonisation of the economy in accordance with the Paris Accord. The European Council has set electricity interconnection targets of 10% by 2020 and 15% by 2030 for all EU member states to achieve and the European Parliament has expressed its support in several resolutions, MEPs are also calling for ambitious interconnection targets by 2030. So here's a very short video to sum up the project.
me introduce you to our panel. Um, we have four. Ambassador Stéphane Cruza has been ambassador of France to Ireland since June 2017. He was previously diplomatic advisor to Ms. Ségolène Royal, Minister for the Environment, Energy and the Sea for three years and involved in the preparation and implementation of the Paris Agreement on, Cli Agreement on Climate Change. He was posted to New York as spokesperson for the French mission to the United Nations and had previous postings in Scotland and in Warsaw. He's worked on EU affairs, having been deputy director of the UE division of Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Paris. He's a graduate of SANS in Paris and École Nationale d'Administration. Each of our speakers will have about five minutes, by the way. Um, so Sean Kelly, coming to us from Kerry this morning, is Ireland South MEP. Sean has been a member of the European Parliament for Ireland since 2009. He's current leader of Fine Gael in Parliament and part of the European Peoples, the EPP group. Mr Kelly sits on the European Parliament's Committees on Industry, Research and Energy, International Trade and Human Rights. And he's also been heavily involved in green politics, leading discussions in his committee ahead of the Paris Agreement and representing Parliament at COP21, 22 and 23. We're also joined this morning by Mary Donnelly, Chairperson of Renewables Energy Ireland. Now, Mary is Chairperson um, and was appointed in January 2019 for a two-year term. She's a former Director of Renewables, Energy Efficiency and Innovation at the Directorate General for Energy of the European Commission. During her 30 years with the European Commission, she was a leading advocate of policies and strategies to accelerate energy transition. She formulated key elements of the Clean Energy for All Europeans package designed to put energy efficiency first, achieve global leadership in renewable energies and provide fair deal for consumers. And she's also an advocate for um, equality. So um, Mark Foley, Mark joined Airgrid Group as chief executive in June 2018, having held the role of Managing Director of Land Solutions in Quilta since January 2016. Previous to that, Mark was Managing Director of Quilta Enterprise, where he led the development of new businesses in renewable energy, telecommunications, development and land sales. Before that, again, he was Director of Capital Programmes at Dublin Airport Authority, and in this role was responsible for master planning, permitting the delivery of 1.5 billion in airport infrastructure at Dublin, Shannon and the wonderful Cork Airport. Mark has a BA in chemical engineering from UCD and a master's in industrial engineering from UCD also and has uh, done courses at Penn University. There we have it, our four illustrious speakers and Stéphane Clouzat, the ambassador um, from France to Ireland. The floor is open to you, please. Thank you very much. Uh, for all that was, uh, I'm delighted to be part of this uh, great initiative. Thank you to EMI Ireland and uh, the uh, European Parliament in, in Ireland for, for organising this. Well, the Celtic Internet has a great video that uh, presented key figures: uh, 575 kilometre project, 500 kilometres on the ground, 700 megawatts, 400,000 homes uh, that will be uh, powered thanks to this. Uh, uh, to this uh, project. It's a long haul project because it will uh, hopefully be in operation in 2026. But, uh, what, what I want to stress is that it, it does go back long because it started off in 2013 when the project was common interest by the EU. Uh, but uh, prior to it, uh, when it happened in 2016, gave the project a new sense of purpose. Uh, because, as we as we know, there is no connection between Ireland and the continent. No connections with the UK, not with the continent. And so, politically, it has become a, a very important issue. You you will remember that uh, when uh, Hollande came to Ireland in 2016 uh, with uh, and that was, uh, and the shop, uh, they uh, they uh, were there when a uh, feasibility was signed. Uh, between the two main operators. And then a few years later, last year in 2019, uh, President Macron and Tishok uh, Vahadka signed a letter 
to uh, uh, to President Juncker uh, to support the request for funding uh, by the EU Commission. And then a few days later, we had uh, François de Rugy, our Minister for uh, in charge of the Environment, uh, met with uh, Minister Bruton and the Tornister, Coveney at the time, in Cork, for the signing of the application by the two operators. And Mark Foley, in fact, was, was there uh, uh, signing this, uh, this uh, application. And all this proved extremely successful because uh, a few months later, in October, we had the excellent news that um, the EU was going to fund this project to the, to the tune of 530 million euros, which corresponds to 57% of the total cost of the project. Uh, so hugely, um, hugely successful bid. And I'm um, delighted to see that uh, despite COVID and, uh, and you know, all, all the upheaval that has happened in the last few months, things are going as planned with phase four now out of six uh, in, uh, in going uh, to finalize the exact location for the transformer in, in Ireland. So this project make, makes complete sense. It makes sense for Ireland because it will really induce a virtuous circle. It will, uh, the project will prove successful if there is a massive development of renewable energy, particularly of offshore wind in Ireland, and the massive development of such energy will only be possible thanks to the connector. There really is an interdependence between, between these, uh, and uh, which will really create this, this virtuous uh, cycle. And of course, it will allow Ireland to be directly linked to the continent. It also makes uh, complete sense for France because um, uh, it will provide energy security to Brittany. Uh, you know that Brittany is really at the western uh, part of France and it's a little bit isolated and sometimes there is that difficulty to bring all that electricity from the east into Brittany and there will be uh, with, uh, with that in fact, the possibility for Brittany to be uh, getting electricity from all the wind turbines that will be blowing the island uh, in, uh, into, into Brittany. And of course it makes sense for both countries within a wider European context. Uh, you, you know, we have uh, this aim to reach 10% of uh, interconnections for every member of the state by 2020 and hopefully 10% by 2030. And with that an interconnector, France is roughly at uh, at uh, this percent, uh, goal, uh, so so really it's it's very important for the EU, the, the European Union as a whole, to have this uh, this uh, this connector, because uh, integration of the EU networks will allow for stability of production, creating export opportunities for periods of intense uh, production. It will uh, allow for security of supply. It will allow for best prices for consumers, and it will also allow for the transition towards less carbon intensive energy throughout Europe. So just in one word, fantastic project, huge political support, and looking forward to it uh, being operational in 2026. Back to you, um, Flo. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Merci beaucoup. And uh, I must just apologise very briefly to our audience for some issues there with the sound. It was a, a little bit indistinct and shaky at times. Let's hope the link to Kerry is better. I'm delighted to uh, welcome our next speaker, um, MEP for Ireland South, Sean Kelly. Okay. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear, Sean. Okay. Thank you, Flora, and hopefully the sound is good from Kerry, as you say. Perfect. And thanks to the European Parliament Liaison Office and the European Movement Ireland for organising this very important event. And as you said in your introduction, I've had the privilege of being involved in the European Parliament over the last 10 years in climate and energy policies. And uh, it is great to see real movement at the end of it. So, now that we are moving along with uh, new ambitions in the European Parliament and the European Commission and to be moving forward with this wonderfully important project uh, for Ireland and for France and indeed for Europe, the Celtic Interconnector is very, very pleasing. 
to begin by putting this project into the European context, the European Green Deal, the flagship policy of the new Commission states clearly that further decarbonizing the energy system is critical to reach climate objectives for 2030, now likely to be 50% and upwards. And of course, 2050, for which the climate law will soon be finalized, setting our target for carbon neutrality. At the same time, according to the Green Deal, the EU's energy supply needs to be secure and affordable for consumers and businesses. I think everyone here will agree that in order to fulfill these extremely important parallel objectives, our ambitious climate and energy policy at EU level, particularly the significantly increased deployment of renewable energy you know, in all member states, necessitates the need for a Necessitates the need for a well integrated and interconnected European electricity market. <clears throat> because of this, connecting EU energy markets is essential, and investing in projects like the Celtic Interconnector, which links Ireland energy system to the French system, brings a number of benefits to our citizens. Firstly, it will deliver better electricity prices, reducing consumer bills, but also aiding Ireland international competitiveness. Secondly, it will enhance our security or electricity supply, particularly important now, I feel, given we will soon be almost 100% reliant on Britain for our gas supply and a new government policy that doesn't appear to seek diversification options for gas. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, it enables us to ramp up our deployment of renewable energy towards our target of at least 70% by 2030 and firmly establish Ireland as a world leader in the sector. This project is timely for a number of reasons, but not least for the fact that its construction will coincide with the implementation of the most ambitious policy and investment framework on climate and energy we have ever seen at EU level in the form of the European Green Deal. Additionally, closer to home, the next 10 years is set to be transformative for the country in terms of decarbonism our economy in line with our climate objectives. And the significant step up in ambition in the program for our government just announced last weekend. In this regard, it is welcome and timely. The Celtic Interconnector is set to be a vital element of our transition to a green economy in the second half of the coming decade. Indeed, without it, I don't think we could do it. Renewable energy is obviously an area in which I have a big interest in being part of the team. In 2008, we negotiated a 32% renewable energy target, which had not for only review clause. Let's not forget that. That was crucial. And upward, it will be going. The ambition of this renewable energy target, along with the European Green Deal, offers an enormous opportunity for Ireland. We have some of the best renewable resources in the world, and with the potential to deploy around 75 DUFs or more of offshore wind, not far from me here, off the coast of Kerry and the west coast of Ireland generally, there is a big chance for us to become a major supplier of renewable electricity to the rest of the EU. This does not happen without the Celtic Interconnector. This project will be a catalyst for enormous investment and job creation in renewable energy on this island. This project positions Ireland perfectly to be a major beneficiary of the European Green Deal. And so the time is now to secure high level of policy support at EU level for the realization of our renewable energy potential and ensure we can capitalize fully on the interconnector when it becomes operational. Securing a strategic project approach to the large scale development of Ireland's renewable energy potential at EU level, along with other similar high potential clusters across the Union, is certainly something that should be explored with Vice President Timmermans in the months ahead. The benefits are clear. In a wider political context, this is a project that helps to bring us even closer to our European friends. Connecting Ireland to France in this way is particularly important, given they are now our closest EU neighbours following Brexit and a very close traditional ally over the years, especially in relation to agricultural matters. 
The Celtic interconnector is an important signal of European solidarity at a crucial time when many people are beginning to question it. And that the European Union has been quick to recognise this as demonstrated by 530 million investment into the project by the European Commission under the Connecting European facility at the end of last year. And this is something that should be highlighted a bit more. This is a project that has deserved recognition at EU level for the benefits it can bring to the European energy system. And I look forward to its completion as soon as possible. With that, I will conclude my introductory remarks and thank you once again. And great to be here with Mark and Marie and others in relation to discussing this very interesting and wonderful project. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, and you, Sean Kelly. Um, I think we had one or two tiny echoes from beautiful Kerry there on the line. Um, and thank you, our audience, for bearing with us on that. Well, let's hear now from Mary Donnelly, who's chairperson of Renewables Energy Ireland. Mary. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, oh, sorry. I beg your pardon, I was actually setting my timer so it's not to go over time, but I'll forget it. You'll let me know if I speak too long. Uh, firstly, thank you very much indeed for the invitation to participate in what is a, an excellent webinar on a super futuristic investment uh, project for Ireland. Uh, the Celtic Interconnector is really very exciting in, in many, many respects. You know, in my time in Brussels, of course, part of the issues that we used to deal with was the single market and trading between member states. And it's interesting to note that electricity is probably the most, the least traded uh, product and service in the European Union. And part of the reason for that is the lack of physical interconnectors between the member states. And yet, interconnectors we have an analyzed will actually be one of the cheapest ways of decarbonizing the economy in Europe. And this is for the very simple reason. Firstly, they give us security of supply, keeping the lights on in the various member states. Secondly, they allow the transmission of energy from locations where it is most efficiently produced to be delivered to other parts where perhaps it's less efficient or less uh, cost effective in terms of its production. And in that context, it means that interconnectors are, shall we say, the Cinderella of the energy system in that they are rarely mentioned or spoken about outside of the system itself. And for that reason, I think it's very good to have this uh, webinar here today. You know, Ireland, uh, it's already been mentioned, uh, has a target of achieving 70% renewable electricity by 2030. This is an ambitious target. It's not unique. If you look at other member states, uh, for example, Poland, Portugal and uh, Denmark, both have targets of 80% renewable electricity by 2030. But in fact, Ireland has a very unique positioning, a little bit similar to Portugal, in that we are on the edge, we are on the extreme of the European Union. Uh, we are physically removed and therefore we are in a very unique situation from that pers perspective and it makes our ambitious target even more challenging as we go forward. As Sean mentioned, we have the resource. Uh, Ireland is particularly fortunate that we have uh, such good resource already with our wind onshore, wind offshore coming up. Uh, ultimately, we'll have marine energy coming on stream in a number of years and solar coming to assist as well. And in Renewable Energy Ireland, we have been interacting with the developers to review the capacity of industry to actually deliver on the ground the targets as set by the government and the Climate Action Plan. And I can confirm that there is enough development in hand, there is enough investment in preparation to deliver that very ambitious target and the industry is very keen, willing and ready to deliver it. There are a few issues, of course, that need to be looked at. One is, of course, the transmission of power, because unlike fossil fuels, where frequently the power source would have been located close, say, to a city or an urban location, with renewable energy, more frequently, the source of power is coming from a distance. It's coming from more remote areas. And therefore, this energy has to be transported to where the demand is. And the transmission system and indeed air grid and ESP networks are absolutely key in terms of delivering that. 
And it also identifies one of the unique challenges we have in Ireland. If you look, for example, at Denmark, they are surrounded by other countries. They have many interconnectors and they can use this, these interconnectors to balance their system. In Ireland, we're an island and balancing our system and maintaining stability of our system will rely on having interconnectors such as the Celtic interconnector and indeed innovations in the technology. And I have to point out that Ireland, Airgrid, ESB networks really are at the forefront globally in terms of the technology of system management and stability for the incorporation of renewable energy. That's one part of the story, but of course there is a second part of the story and that is the consumer and communities. And for the consumer in Ireland, the interconnector represents three very real and tangible benefits. Uh, firstly, security of supply. As they say, keeping the lights on. It is an essential element. We do want that as a provision in place and this will be an important assistance in that respect. It will reduce costs and Mark no doubt will tell us what the interconnector, the East West uh, interconnector has done in terms already of reducing costs. And thirdly, it will allow us to bring renewable energy, indeed indigenous Irish energy into our electricity system, thus reducing the import costs of fuels from other parts of the world and using our own natural resources. But the reality is that for communities and for some communities in particular, this means the infrastructure will have to be built in their locality. And this is always a sensitive issue. You know, when we build a motorway, it benefits everybody, but somebody finds themselves living beside the motorway or a bridge or an airport, as the case may be. And this is where it's very important that communities understand the rationale, the reason for these investments, what the benefits are, not just for themselves, but ultimately for the society in Ireland are. And of course, the communities have the opportunity to be fully involved, participate, and understand how this process is going to move forward. In the end of the day, it's only when you get the combination of the government policies, you get the combination of the industry behind it as well in terms of investment, but most importantly, you get people on the ground in Ireland working together for Ireland Inc. that we will be able to develop develop and deliver a project as significant as the Celtic Interconnector. So I hope our discussion today will allow us to tease out a number of issues relating to that because it really is a very important moment in Ireland's development. Thank you. Mary, thank you very much for that most interesting presentation and I know we will definitely return to some of those points in the uh, Q&A in, in a little while. Um, but now I'm delighted to welcome Mark Foley, CEO of Airgrid. Mark, over to you. Good morning all. Thank you for the kind invitation to talk about this fantastic project. I often describe it as arguably the most important infrastructure project in Ireland in the next decade. This is also happening at quite an historic moment where two of Ireland's longest standing political foes in political terms have entered into a coalition government, which also includes the, the Green Party. And I think this, this particular construct of government will have, I think, a profound impact on the direction of travel for Ireland in terms of our ambition to deal with climate change. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, I borrowed this from McKinsey. I hope I I, I, they, they won't be uh, put out by this, but look, just to put everything in context and much of what I'm going to talk about in 12 slides is to put interconnection in, in the overall context. Um, CO2 levels in the atmosphere have bumped along somewhere on average about 280 parts per million, never exceeded 400. Well, they now have, they passed 400 parts per million after 350,000 years of the, our capacity to measure data in terms of atmospheric CO2. Um, and on a do-nothing basis, we hit a thousand parts per million in the next decade. So if that doesn't crystallize the problem, um, what does? So I think we've passed the point of questioning the science bar, maybe the odd crackpot who'll always find an outlet on some desperate media outlet. Next slide, please. The Irish government's response has been in two parts. Last year, the Irish government declared a climate emergency. I think it was passed unanimously by the Doyle. But secondly, and crucially, it was to create arguably one of the most ambitious policy objectives in our history as a sovereign state. We're 100 years old as a sovereign state, and the climate 
action plan, in my view, matches any of the great policy initiatives in those hundred years. It's visionary. It's incredibly challenging. It speaks across, if not all, certainly most sectors of the economy. And with a focus on a new low carbon vision for both Irish society and our economy. It was launched in June of last year. Next slide, please. What does it mean? This, I, well, the numbers tell the story. Uh, our baseline position is approximately 60 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent across five major elements of our society. The Climate Action Plan is betting the whole delivery of this plan on electricity by seeking to reduce the carbon intensity of the electricity system, the electricity sector, I should say, by over 60% and thus drive synergistic savings into transport and heat as they transition to electrical energy from fossil fuels. Interestingly, that equates to approximately three to three and a half percent reduction per year. Well, our newly formed government have agreed to an even greater overall reduction between now and 2030. And we await their deliberations of where the additional emphasis will land. Their target is 7% and is much more aligned with the Paris Agreement. So much more to come, but the electricity sector will continue to be at the epicenter of this transition, whatever comes out of the government's uh, thinking in respect of the 7% annual target. Next slide, please. For AirGrid, um, this transition, it translates into trans transitioning from a position where by last year we averaged 36% renewables on the All Island Power System. Now I'm talking about on average over the whole year to an ambition in 2030 where the government has set an ambition of 70%. So just think about it. In 2030, 70% of all electricity across all sectors of the economy will come from renewables. And this is a massive, massive transition on the system into transport and into, and into heating. And AirGrid's next slide, please. Or sorry, stay in this slide. AirGrid's purpose that we have constructed on the back of this ambition is basically to transform the power system for future generations. And we launched this purpose statement of this strategy in September of last year. Next slide, please. Central to this purpose is our primary goal, which is to lead Ireland's uh, electricity sector, our system, on, on sustainability and de decarbonisation, to stand up and to be counted and to put all of what we do around this prim primary goal of, of leading our country. Next slide, please. What does it mean? Where is the... Uh, next slide, please. So... What does this mean? So what does this leadership proposition actually mean in hard terms? It means six things. Firstly, from a current base of four and a half thousand megawatts of renewables, mainly onshore wind on the Ireland system, that's excluding Northern Ireland, if we include Northern Ireland, we're well over 5,000. We need to add an additional 10,000 10, megawatts of renewable energy. That'll come in the form of onshore wind, uh, offshore wind, and, 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 and uh, solar energy. So we have to do in the next 10 years, uh, twice what we did in the last 15 to 20, an enormous challenge. Secondly, we have to reinforce the grid. We won't achieve this without reinforcing the grid. And that means new wires, it means upgraded wires, and it means new technologies on the existing wires. Interconnection is at the core, and I'll speak to the role of interconnection when I speak specifically to Celtic, but without interconnection, the jigsaw doesn't work. The plan doesn't work the 70% on average renewables does not work. Fourthly, we need to design a power system which can operate to close, at close to 100% renewable energy because to achieve 70% on average over 365 days of the year, you have to be able to harness the, the wind when it's, when, when it's at its max in the winter time in order to achieve that average. Little anecdote last Sunday, last Sunday we had 65% renewables on the power system, constrained for reasons of technology. Um, and on top of that, we did another 7% with a full flow of electricity across the east-west interconnector. Irish wind powering the United Kingdom um, with, 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 with green energy. And if last Sunday was in 2030, with all of the interconnectors up and running, including Celtic, we, I can confidently say our power system would, be, would have been operating at 98, 99%. Fifthly, the market must evolve. If the market doesn't evolve, 
investment will not happen. So this is not just about technology. This is also about uh, evolving the market and the trading environment and the investment sentiment for people who will invest in technology and other solutions. And lastly, just a bit of a hobby horse of mine, in all of this, Airgrid will want to be an exemplar, just in terms of how we work, how we conduct our business, if we're going to be part of this massive transformation. Next slide, please. So. Next question is, why is interconnection so, so important? So I painted a picture of it being part of this very complex jigsaw of, of five major elements. Um, firstly, next slide, security of supply. Nine of the top global pharmaceutical companies are here in Ireland. All of the top ICT companies are here with European headquarters. 30% of Europe's data is housed here in Ireland. Intel supplies a major portion of global semiconductors out of, out of Ireland. We and they must have secure power. We must have backup from other countries where needed, including the UK currently, and in the medium term when Celtic is built from France. And of course, we have the additional, um, we have the additional concern arising out of Brexit, which just brings greater complexity. Next slide, please. Competition in the electricity market. You have already, Mary and others have spoken to this. Prices differ significantly around Europe. The more we interconnect, the more prices will literally, they will, they, they will evolve to the lowest, lowest price coming out of the most competitive market. So competition is ultimately at the, at, the, at the core of the European project and interconnection helps that. Next slide, please. And crucially, sustainable energy. We must have green power if we're to facilitate renewables, which may not be fully understood by, by people. We in Ireland, last Sunday, we turned wind farms off because we simply could not handle it on the system. If the Celtic interconnector had been there, we'd have been shipping 700 uh, megawatts to, to, to... We need a power system that can handle close to 100% renewables. And crucially, those 10,000 megawatts that I spoke about earlier that we need people to invest in, onshore, offshore and solar, they will only do so if they have a business case to do so. You don't have a successful business case if you're being switched off a lot of the time by the TSO. So we need routes to market and interconnection provides routes to market for green energy. Next slide, please. So what is the Celtic interconnector? And look, it's already been spoken about, but I'll, I'll avoid excess repetition, but it's a proposed electrical link between Ireland and, and France. And it's, it's a fabulous example of cooperation between Airgrid and our counterpart in France. I'm gonna try and say it, Rezu, the Transport de l'Electricité, RTE, uh, bad, bad, bad effort. Um, it involves the construction of a high voltage direct current subsea circuit between Ireland and France with the capacity 700 megs, which basically could power close to half a million homes. So it's an enormous proposition. 575 kilometers in length, of which about 500 is under the sea, and it'll link East Cork to Brittany. It developed jointly, as I said, it's got a capital cost estimate of approximately 1 billion. We'll never know till we finish procurement. Project of common interest, and it has, been, it has been in the mix, as the ambassador said, for many, many years in terms of feasibility studies, getting it uh, assigned project of common interest status, um, work with regulators to ensure that regulators will underpin the investment. And I think one of the proudest moments of my professional career, and indeed um, my, 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 my life as, a, as an Irish citizen, was to go to Brussels in October 2019 and just, just privilege and, and, and the wonder of, of receiving formal um, consent for a grant of 530 million from the European Commission as, as a manifest commitment to the, the interconnection of Ireland with France, and all the more important in the context where our current connection with Europe is via the UK, and of course the UK have left the EU. So, um, fantastic day in October of last year, and one, I, one, one I'll never forget. Broad legal entity has now been established between the Irish and the French teams, and on the basis of all of these considerations, we expect the interconnector to be commissioned sometime between 25 and 2026. 20, We've spoken about the benefits already, but one other I want to mention, two others I want to mention, gives us a connection to the EU when we lose, uh, when Brexit manifests. And secondly, and crucially, and we are, here we are experiencing the benefits of fantastic uh, you know, digital technology. It'll help us to create a direct link with France 
uh, to exploit digital data, data transmission in, into the heart of Europe. Next slide, slide, please. Where are we on the project in terms of time, feasibility phase done, design, initial design and pre-construction uh, consultation complete, detailed design and uh, is underway at the moment. And we're in the, we're very close to making the final decision. And this will be the seminal decision for us this year is where is it going to land in Cork and where is the converter station going to be located? That will be concluded this year and will be right into the heart of the very detailed environmental impacts assessments, etc. So we're very hopeful. If I was on a webinar two years time today, I'd be saying construction has started or is, or, or is imminent. Next slide, please. Thank you, that's it. Quick, a quick, a quick dash through the whole project and more importantly, the context, where does it sit in terms of Ireland's ambition and indeed Airgrid's ambition to be, to be at the epicentre of Ireland's revolution in terms of the transformation of the power system for future generations. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mark. And I have to say your French accent wasn't bad at all. And well done for attempting it. But Fringe moment. A most interesting um, presentation. And thank you. The slides were, were really great. Um, so we're just going to take uh, audience questions in a few moments. And could I just remind everybody that if you would like to pose a question, or post a question even, and the Q&A button on your Zoom will do that for you and bring your question to us. Um, also on Facebook and on Twitter, please use the hashtag EUConnects. So I would just like to pose one or two questions uh, to you all to, to start off. And Mark, you mentioned, and uh, I noticed that Sean Kelly did as well, our new programme for government and in fact the new coalition government that Ireland has. And this is going to be a, a great opportunity for action on climate and action on energy. And Michal Martin in the Doyle, our new Taoiseach on Saturday, said the programme we have agreed puts action on climate change into the work of every government department. We must not just overcome this challenge, but we must turn it into a new opportunity. I'm wondering though, for consumers, how will they see this as, as an opportunity and benefiting them in brief? Would like to take that. Um, can see, are you, there's, there's two dimensions to this. There's the sort of the macro, which is what's happening in the broad, the, the broad uh, direction of travel in terms of decarbonizing our, our society and our economy. And then there's consumers maybe as active participants potentially, and that's something Maria speaks very eloquently to. On the first bit, um, the price of wholesale electricity in Ireland has, has, has stayed, has, has remained rock solid in, in 15 years as we put more and more renewables on the system. What basically happens is renewables drive down the cost of wholesale electricity. Now, there is a counterbalance where developers have to be and have been compensated through the PSO me mechanism. But in the round, and if you look at IWEA's last stu uh, study um, carried out by Beringa, who are extremely rep rep reputable, overall the price of wholesale electricity has dropped in the last 15 years due to renewables. I am absolutely confident that as we go on the next journey to 2030, with advances in technology that are simply staggering and the offshore wind proposition which will be part of Ireland's solution, I can absolutely commit will deliver exceptional levels of price into the Irish market in a competitive environment. I've no fears of this. I think the technology will deliver the lower costs which will ultimately translate into consumers' bills. We can do this without a massive over, overhang in terms of cost to consumers, absolutely convinced. I let Marie speak to the whole issue of the consumer becoming a participant, which is very complex, very laudable, but quite challenging over the next number of years. Okay, so Marie, how can interconnection with France result briefly in lower energy prices for consumers? Well, I suppose that the simplest way to do it is that it introduces um, an Aldi or a Lidl competitor into the retail market in that <clears throat> for peak demand, when we go to the edges and prices would normally go up, we can go to the interconnector and get the electricity from France at their price and make it available in Ireland. And just, you know, in terms of numbers, um, 
you know, the prices for the moment between um, UK and, or France and, and Ireland, there's about a three euro cent difference between the, in prices. And just at the moment, I can't find the figures, but uh, there is a price difference. It's cheaper in France so that when we bring it in, it forces the price in Ireland down and consumers can benefit from that. And we've seen this. This is not something that we invent. We've seen it already with the interconnector, the east-west interconnector. So consumers can save. And in fact, over, over all of the European Union, the Commission has done a study and estimates that consumers can save 12, 12 billion euros a year through interconnectors because it will bring down, you saw on Mark's slide, the price of electricity and how in some parts of Europe it's very high and in others it's lower. The lowest electricity in Europe is in what they call Nord Pool. It's the Scandinavian countries and Denmark and that's because they have lots of interconnectors and they can trade so they have a very competitive market and that's ultimately where the Celtic interconnector will allow Ireland to participate in that kind of competitive market as well. Okay thanks Mary. Um, all four of you have been extremely enthusiastic about the project in your presentations and in, in, in answers. Um, a fantastic opportunity, a wonderful project bringing economic benefits, the biggest infrastructure project um, in a decade. I'm just wondering why has it taken so long then and why uh, are Ireland and France a good match? Why has it taken so long? Why does why is the Galway bypass taking 20 odd years? Infrastructure is a is a is a gritty business um, from conception to uh, delivery. Ten years is a short time span in infrastructure, um, and equally, infrastructure has to be of its time. So we have been superbly served by the East West Interconnector to the United Kingdom, um, which, as I said last week, and at many times in the winter, has been exporting at 100% from Ireland to the UK. This is part of the jigsaw, the 2030 jigsaw. To have it in place five years ago would have been premature. But what I like about it is the thinking and the planning and the vision has been knocking around for 10 years. And it means, from my perspective, that the proposition is so robust, the case is so compelling. Um, and indeed, eventually, when we do get it procured, the technology will be of another generation which of course will, will, will add further benefits. So, you know, 20 years, 10 years is nothing in infrastructure terms. Look at, look at how Ireland's been built in the last 50 years. And you can point to many, many examples of where that is the gestation time in a modern democracy where we give people a voice and where, where we have very sophisticated planning, planning systems. That's, 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 that's the nature of things. I don't, can I add a, a, a word on that? Uh, it's, I mean, 10 years is a, is a normal time for such a huge project. Uh, we can see also that we had a, a, another project with Spain of an interconnector, which uh, also has, you know, is taking a long time. I want to insist on the, uh, on the significance of the EU funding for, for that project. We mentioned 530 million. Now, to get a, a point of comparison out of a 930 million project, to get a point of comparison, we uh, got funding for the France-Spain uh, interconnector in the Golf de Gascogne, the Gulf of Gascony, uh, for a 370 uh, kilometer uh, interconnector. So it's a bit shorter, but technically much more uh, demanding, as I understand, because there are huge uh, crevices in, uh, under the, the, the Gulf of Gascony. And this whole project uh, will cost about uh, 1.7 billion euros and the EU Commission has given, has allocated 578 million, so slightly more than for our project, uh, but uh, in, in uh, overall terms, much less because we get 57% of, uh, of the whole cost of the project. So I, I just want to reiterate how, um, how much we got funding from the EU, uh, because it's really, really very significant. Thank you very much, Master. Sean Kelly, could I uh, ask you a question briefly? You're the MEP representing um, the South of Ireland, and I'm just wondering what are people in Munster saying about the connector? How are the public reacting so far? 
Um, they haven't really engaged with it yet. They're looking at projects maybe within their own area rather than looking at the Celtic Interconnector. So if you look at it, we were just discussing a minute ago, why it has taken so long. Well, number one, I suppose we couldn't do it during the recession. But I can tell you, a little over a year ago, I was speaking to a key minister, Warren Nathan, about the importance of this project. And he told me it will never happen. Cost too much. If we invest in renewable energy projects at local level, biomass, etc., we won't need it. So the thinking wasn't there, the publicity probably wasn't there. But I think now, with a new government, and I actually welcome the Greens into government because they're increasing our ambition. But that ambition had been taking root already amongst the public, the scene in the vote that the Green Scott going from north to 12 TDs, 7%. But also, as Mark pointed out, the climate and action plan designed by the last government under Richard Wooten. So I think people will welcome this, especially when they see, as Mary pointed out, it's going to reduce costs. Nothing focuses the minds of people better than saying your electricity prices will come down. But also, equally importantly, people are more aware now of the need to decarbonize than any time in the past. You could really say only in the last year or two, people have really engaged in this, recognizing what's happened, and now with the problem for government, I think you will see there'll be a huge appetite for this to happen. And also we mustn't forget, as my colleague from France pointed out, 530 million from the European Union for this project is very significant. And people need to be aware of that to show the support that is there at European level for good projects, be there from Ireland and anywhere else. Right. Well, thanks very much, Sean. Um, you said that the people are, are very, you know, will be very vocal on it. Let's hear directly from them. We've got some great questions coming in from our audience, and I'm going to put some of them now to, to the panel. This question here, the direction of power through the interconnector will be determined by electricity price. With offshore wind and solar, I'm sure we'll see very low electricity prices in 10 years plus time. What do we know about France's plans for the future? And a related question, are they going to continue with nuclear or are they moving towards wind and solar? Would like to take that. That's a nice trust. Uh, Stefan, I suppose. Yeah, I'm happy to respond the, on that one on the nuclear front. Uh, we, uh, as you know, we currently produce about 70% of our electricity is from nuclear source. And there was a huge debate uh, four years ago now on whether that was the appropriate amount or whether we should uh, uh, decrease it. And in the end, we decided through a law, the transition, uh, 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 energy transition law in 2015, that we should uh, decrease that amount to 50% uh, of uh, generation electricity would be from nuclear and that would be compensated by the rise in renewable energy mainly offshore onshore wind and uh, and solar uh, so uh, we were at 75 we're now at 70 and so uh, we're slowly getting towards that level it should take us a good a good uh, 15 years to reach uh, that level Okay, thank you very much, um, Stefan, for that. Another one here. As we become reliant on interconnection, which is described by the uh, questioner as a good thing, how will we protect our undersea cables from bad actors? So this is a question on security, um, which has been described as one of the benefits of the Celtic interconnector. Will we agree a security solution with others or invest in our naval service? <laughs> that's that's it's quite an interesting question actually one i haven't i hadn't thought of before um in terms of um you're talking about sort of acts of terrorism or, or stuff of that nature yes and, and clearly clearly that's a risk we have every day of the week in all aspects of our business whether it's the you know the line between ireland and northern ireland as a, a, a much troubled line in its in its time whether it's the cyber risk that is ever present in terms of 
parties wanting to get in, in at the electricity system because you can do untold or you can have untold impact if you shut a country's power system down. So I think it, it, does, it, it just sits in that universe of risks that we have to be A, aware of and B, have clear contingencies and mit 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 mitigations around. Um, and ultimately, when it comes to interconnection, your system has to be secure that without it, you're still going to be okay. That is one of the overriding um, you know, factors in, in, in signing up to interconnection. You still have to be able to operate your system if it goes down because they do fail. They're not, they don't have the same reliability as an overhead AC line. Um, but look, it's, it's, another, it's another dimension in terms of the you know, global challenges we have to deal with that we, we have to be alert to. Yeah. Challenges on a more local level. We we're getting questions on that too, Mark, just while, while you're here. Um, when in construction and once completed, how many jobs will this create in Ireland and in France? Post-construction, it's a modest number of jobs um, because ultimately these things are highly automated. Um, they, run, they run by themselves. They're managed from a control room. So there is, 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 it's not a long-term sort of employment prospect per se. You'll have an awful lot of people involved in, in the construction phase, certainly. But you look to the ben the benefits are just are not about local, you know, local employment. The benefits are very much about enabling this transition. I go back to the slide where I showed six dimensions. You take one of those dimensions out and it's not going to happen. We are not going to achieve our, our ambition. So it's a critical part of this jigsaw of a transformed power system. And then the benefits accrue in other ways. If they benefit the crews in, in locally where you can plug in your electric car, you know your energy is going to be green, your energy will be cheaper. There's no question about that. All the analysis suggests so. And of course, we're protecting our, our you know, I have two grandsons, three and a year, nearly a year old. We're creating a future that is sustainable for, our, for those who follow us. And if I may add on that, of course, Floor, I mean, uh, we currently have about four to 5,000 jobs in the renewable energy industry in Ireland as it is. Those numbers will probably double as we go forward, as we roll out more onshore and certainly offshore wind and solar. Um, and these jobs are protected. These jobs are maintained by virtue of the fact that our system is going to be sufficiently robust. So it, it, it's, yes, new jobs locally, but it is, also protecting the existing jobs that exist throughout the country, not just in the locality where the, the line will land, but throughout the rest of the country. Thanks, Marie. And here's a, a quite related question on business. What kind of cooperation opportunities will the Celtic Interconnector bring for Irish and also foreign companies? Well, the, uh, the Interconnector is... Uh, Part, part of the challenge of running the electricity system, of course, is maintaining stability. Uh, not being an engineer, I have to have things explained to me in a very simple way. So when people talk, when Mark, for example, talks about stability in the system and the grid and maintaining that, a colleague one time explained it to me like, you know, the spinning top you had when you were a child and you could pump it up and it would spin around and would make lovely noise and music, and whatever. And as it ran out of power, the sound would go and then it would fall over. So that's how I associate keeping the grid in position. It's, it's the analogy I have in my head. And part of the challenge there is peak demand. And for the industry in Ireland, being able to cope with peak demand is hugely important. You know, in a data center, they cannot afford to be out of power even for a second. It's just one of those things they absolutely have to have. So just like we're the connector protects jobs in the renewable industry. It also protects jobs in the, the data sector industry, but the pharma industry as well, because it ensures that, the, as I simply call it, the lights can stay on. And without that flexibility, it would make things much more expensive because we'd have to substantially overbuild our own resources in Ireland. On that fluctuation of power, can, can any of you explain how the very variability of Ireland's renewable energy poses problems when it comes to security of, of electricity supply? I'd speak to that. I mean, yes, of course. And you've, you've, your, your question's a very good one, Flora. I mean, wind and solar are variable and ultimately you do need a backstop. 
the backstop for the, ne the next 10 years and beyond will be gas. There is, and, and let's not pretend otherwise. And preferably uh, gas that is of the lowest intensity of, of, uh, of, of carbon emissions, because um, not all gas is the same in terms of carbon intensity. And again, it's important to be honest and to say that. We know that the carbon intensity of fracked gas is upwards of three times that of, say, say natural gas. So until we develop the green um, combustible um, fuel to ultimately backstop the power system, which we all, many people think is going to be hydrogen, we have a dependency for this transition on hopefully the cleanest form of natural gas. And it's important to be honest and to say that, and not to create an impression. When I talk about 100% renewables being capable of operating on the power system, last Sunday, 10 years on, um, we know that is intermittent and the next day there could be no wind blowing and you, you, you're going to need a fossil. But we must focus on A, the lowest carbon intensity fossils and B, the acceleration of R&D and investment in, in the, the production of hydrogen from renewable energy, which is a lovely equation. You have green energy producing a, a, a green combustible fuel. So. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, we've got a question here on the funding. Um, have a think about who'd like to take this. Both the European Commission and the European Investment Bank have provided significant funding to ensure that the project is completed. So there's a question about how was this achieved and who were the key stakeholders who ensured these successes in, in the funding? Does it look like that's me again? I think, yeah. I, I rounded up to sort of a billion. I know um, fr um, the ambassador rightly corrected me, the official number is 930, but you know, in, in the round, it's a billion euro project. The funding, firstly, the project could not proceed without um, the grant accruing from the U European Union. It would not work financially. So we now have 530 million bagged. Secondly, ourselves and our colleagues in France, RTE, will jointly then fund the balance. And we'll fund that through a combination potentially equity and debt, which is a very traditional model that's used. Um, we will put our own money into it and we'll raise money. And we're delighted, <laughs> I can't overemphasize, that the European Investment Bank, which is a fantastic source of low interest funding and is one of the biggest funders of infrastructure right around Europe and indeed beyond, um, they, are, they have all the indications are that they are very, very keen to get involved in the project. And there might be some funding from the normal banking community, whether it's the, the, the banks that RTE deploy or whether it's our bank. So with that grant as a backstop, we are in a very, very um, positive and I won't say comfortable as a bad choice of words, but very confident position that we can make the whole equation um, add up. So you've grant, you've EIB, you have the normal banks and you have our own equity. And that's the type of, that's the way these constructs tend, tend to operate. But without the grant, we wouldn't have a project. And I again want to thank uh, the European Commission for, for the support. It's been phenomenal. Well, let's, let's... If I may just on that one, because I think, you know, Sean is modestly not saying too much, but, you know, the committee that he's on and indeed the role he has played as, you know, rapporteur for a number of dossiers, has been hugely important in terms of supporting what's called the CEF, which is the Connecting Europe facility, which is the funding mechanism that the European Commission uses for interconnections between the member states. And, you know, this came out of uh, the, the financial crisis, where there was a first attempt to support financial investment in energy projects, and then became more institutionally structured in the budget about five years ago, seven years ago. And I have to say that the European Parliament was hugely supportive of that. And, you know, Sean doesn't say too much, but he plays a very important role in ensuring that projects and funding like the CEF happen so that out of it, you can get funding then in Ireland for things like the interconnector. Thanks, Mary. And um, I was just going to uh, ask Sean a question there as well. So we're putting him on the spotlight now for a while. And maybe, Stefan, you might like to, to come in on this. The, the project comes, of course, um, as the UK leaves the EU. We're talking about Brexit. And the, the UK was the country that we were most reliant on with our only interconnector there. Um, can you tell me 
uh, the implications of Brexit, really, in an, an energy perspective. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's because there will be a third country, then they will be bound by European law. But at the same time, I think you could exaggerate it probably too, because there is a good uh, connection and a good uh, friendship between Ireland and the UK. So you could hardly see them pulling the plug on us, but at the same time, we cannot be 100% dependent. And uh, Mark referred there, for instance, to gas being the only backup for renewables over the next 10 years. Now we have only one single pipeline from the United Kingdom to Moffat for our gas supply, with car runs out in a couple of years. And that's something I think that uh, the European Union and many people would not be too comfortable with. Whether it will be sufficient or not, we don't have to see. But definitely it has added impetus, Brexit has added impetus to the interconnector because it gives us that security, that independence, apart from the ability to trade our excess renewable energy when it comes. And Mark made a very interesting point where they had to turn off renewable energy uh, last week because they had no place to send it to. So all those practicalities are very important. But the United Kingdom will be going their own way. They will do what's good for the United Kingdom, where the European Union will be integrated doing what's best for the 27 member states. And we need to be more connected with them than ever before. And we'll just come back to one or two points which you mentioned. Nuclear was a very interesting question. This time yesterday, I was on a webinar with the ITRA committee on nuclear. And nuclear, the image we have of nuclear really is because of safety. We were guaranteed yesterday that it is no longer an issue. It is completely different to what it was 10 or 15 years ago. So nuclear is going to become even probably more important for the countries like France that utilize it, but it's far safer than people think because the image is of it going back to Fukushima, Chernobyl and so forth, but that's not going to probably happen. And then finally, in relation to jobs, jobs are going to be key and there are huge job opportunities here as Nari pointed out. And she also used a very good analogy in relation to price when she said it's like in Aldi or Little in here that connects with people. But jobs alone worldwide are expected to quadruple in renewable energy over the next uh, 10 years. And the same will happen in Ireland and probably more, especially if we begin to utilize the offshore wind, which is enormous potential, but which can only be developed in a commercial way if we have the interconnected with France. And I think that's going to be crucial. Okay. And Stéphane Cruzat, the uh, ambassador, could I just ask you, Sean Kelly there spoke about the project being a great example of, of EU solidarity. Would you agree with that? Well, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's technically and economically uh, viable, but it's also politically extremely important. And that's why it got this uh, huge political support, which I mentioned uh, earlier on from uh, at the highest level uh, with President Macron and Leo Varadkar signing this letter to ask for that support um, to, the, to President Juncker. So it's definitely, definitely very, uh, um, you know, it's, it's hugely symbolically important. Um, it, uh, there was an, another thing I wanted to mention about uh, Britain and, uh, you know, <laughs> Britain leaving the, the EU. Uh, Britain will, you know, whether they're in or out of the EU, they'll be here to stay with uh, 66 million people uh, which and who will all need electricity. So I, I don't foresee a, a sudden break in the interconnection between uh, Britain and the rest of Europe. Indeed, we mm -hmm. have uh, interconnections with Britain, one of them going through the, the Euro Tunnel, and I uh, understand the green link between uh, uh, Ireland and Wales is underway. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's due to be finished uh, in, in a couple of years. And, and that shows that there is this need for greater interconnection between all, uh, all countries uh, in Europe, on the, in Europe geographic, on, in the geographical sense. 
I understand that the, the green link is uh, going ahead and it will complement uh, the Celtic interconnector uh, thanks to the rise in renewable energy in, in Ireland. Okay, Ambassador, any final remarks from any of you before we begin to wrap up? Uh, Mark here, I have one. It's just something that really arises from the COVID experience. And I think it's very relevant um, in terms of the challenges facing Ireland Inc. ahead. If you look at how such a, a, the good job the government did in terms of communication, in terms of transparency, in terms of setting out uh, sort of the call to arms to, to the people of the nation um, and to get behind what was the right thing to do to protect the health of older people in particular, and, and but everybody in society, and how Ireland Inc. responded in the most responsible of manners. And of course, there's exceptions, and there's been plenty of examples of bad behaviour. But generally speaking, we've had an unprecedented response from, from Ireland uh, Inc. And wouldn't you love to see such a similar approach being adopted in terms of the decarbonisation challenge? People don't know about the Climate Action Plan. People don't know, if I, that McKinsey slide I showed you, of, of the consequences of us not acting in the next 10 years. And if people knew and if they understood and if there was a communication plan that, that we would all, I mean, I'm not put, pointing the finger at the government, we all have a role to, to play in this. Maybe we could create a sense of common purpose around this, this, this challenge that would help us on the journey to 2030. Because if we don't have hearts and minds with us, we could be, the trajectory around delivery could be very, very disappointing if an awful lot of the big ticket projects just get admired in court proceedings and objections. So there is an opportunity here to learn from the, you know, what was a very successful COVID response, not diminishing in any way, um, you know, the, the number of people who've died and indeed if people have lost loved ones, et cetera. But this is an opportunity we shouldn't lose. Okay, Mark, anybody else? Sean's trying to get in there. Sean, you need to say a word? I think you're muted. I just want to say that the timing of this couldn't be better, especially from an Irish point of view. Here we are, with a new government, with Fianna Fáil and Fianna Dale being forced to concede greater ambition with the Greens involved, even though they were ambitious enough, in fairness to them, before that. But now, with the interconnector, with the new policy in government, this is going to drive investment in renewables in Ireland. Because now they have government policy behind them, they also have the ability to sell to the interconnector. So it makes any renewable energy project far more viable. And it's going to be hugely important in that regard. And I can see over the next couple of years, far more investment in renewables, enthusiastically given, not just because of the desire to lower emissions, but because there'd be an opportunity to make profit from it. And when you have instruments at European level, like InvestEU, which are devoting about 25% of their funds to renewable projects or climate mitigation projects anyway, the timing couldn't be better from our point of view. So let's drive it on. So it's been a pleasure to be involved here this morning. Thanks to Marion Mark and the Ambassador, and also to yourself for moderating this lovely project this morning very well. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much, um, Sean, for, for those kind words. Um, and thank you all very much to the audience for your questions, um, which are still coming in, I have to say, but I'm afraid time is against us. So just a few closing remarks to wrap up and I suppose sum up um, some of what we've heard. It was striking, I believe, how positive um, all of these contributions were. Um, fantastic, wonderfully important, enormous opportunity, just some of the words used this morning to describe the um, Celtic interconnector. Key among the benefits, the French ambassador spoke of the virtuous circle for Ireland in which we boost renewables and lower prices and France also benefits. Um, Sean Kelly, we heard there, emphasised the funding, 530 million euro from the EU is an example of EU 
solidarity. And he also spoke about it, how it reflected um, how France is our closest EU member state post Brexit and a closer, even closer relationship is emerging there. Mary spoke of the super futuristic project that this is and that it will end the fact that electricity is one of the least traded EU commodities due to an absence so far of interconnectors. And she also presented the challenge, new electricity supplies come from remote locations and has to be transported to where it's needed and Ireland is going to be an innovator in this. Mark explained how competition is at the core of the EU project and we need interconnectors. He also spoke about uh, this means the grid and uh, it has to change. Renewables are, 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 if renewables are to be sustainable and that is something that of course is in the programme for government when Ireland looks ahead and as Mark also said that this new coalition is putting climate action and renewables at its core. So again thank you all very much um, for your wonderful contributions to um, Sean Kelly MEP coming live from Kerry loud and clear to our French ambassador Stéphane Cruza, Mary Donnelly and Mark Foley and uh, again once again to our audience. Thank you also to the European Parliament Liaison Office in Ireland and to James Temple Smithson for hosting this very timely event and to European Movement Ireland for supporting the webinar. Hopefully you can all join us uh, soon in person in the European Parliament Liaison Office in Dublin uh, at uh, Europe House and we're going to put some details on screen now of how you can all keep in touch um, on this Celtic Interconnector project and on other projects that uh, will be relevant um, looking ahead. So once again, thank you all very much for joining us today. <laughs>